Welcome to CTO Think, a podcast about leadership, product development, and tech decisions between two recovering chief technology officers. Here are your hosts, Don Vandemark and Randy Burgess. Hey, Don, it's 2020. What's up? Well, Happy New Year. Uh, not a whole lot, just working through uh, more uh, tools that, that building with, uh, with Flow and Power Apps. That's going pretty well. Um, found a oddity this morning that we can't right click paste into teams for some reason. So I got to dig that out. Um, but minor thing. So, uh, what about you? Uh, I'm almost 44. So having back pain, back spasms is best definitely on the menu for things I want to be doing this week. But, uh, that's, that's what I'm, I've, I strained my calf. Like, so moving to Kansas, the winters are just so much more balanced here compared to Chicago. And right. so I'm out playing tennis um, at like 46 degrees or so on New Year's Day. And then I pull a calf muscle and then I walk around limping, which gets my hips unbalanced and then my, I get back spasms. So... I'm basically laid up trying to get, I mean, I'm working, working remote and being not a hundred percent is actually a benefit, I guess. Um, Except I have to sit in a chair and then trying to stand up first. But uh, that's my, that's been my week. Um, But actually what I've been working on lately, and we've talked about content management since we started Mm -hmm. the podcast almost two years ago. Right. And I'm back in the content management question um, because of a side project. And there's someone at my current job has asked me about it too. And so I wanted to talk about the, the new modern approach to content management that, I, that has kind of sprung up and like what your thoughts are on it. Um, so this is, this is beyond WordPress and beyond uh, Drupal. This is the new stuff. Y- yes. And a little bit of old. Okay. So let me explain. So you and I both started in a, in the content management space around WordPress and Drupal. And the goals of, the, of those software is to provide a complete, um, almost a complete full stack of a theme system, a, a developer system for customizations, and a backend database system for persistence, and a almost a server I mean, the, the software acts as a server of sorts right. <clears throat> and it allows an interface, an admin interface for non-technical users to manage that content, right. to maybe change the theme, to tweak around SEO, that kind of thing, and to allow for user custom content based on authentication and authorization. All that in one. And then if you need to, you could attach e-commerce to it. That's what we sure. started. That's what we started in. And lately I've seen companies online and in the developer um, communications, Twitter, whatever, Slack. There's been a fork. You've got now three strong approaches. The first one... I guess is what we just talked about, the WordPress, the the full stack solution. And then the one that's kind of crept up that I like, I saw it a couple of years ago. And now apparently it's a really popular one is Webflow, which is uh, Webflow and Squarespace, which are SaaS products. They are all online for the interfaces. You don't deal with the database. You don't deal with a server. You just simply 
start paying for a monthly fee and based on your use case, you pay less or more. Webflow is more like Dreamweaver. Squarespace is more like front page in that the vi- you control the visuals with a GUI interface. You're not writing a lot of code. Um, if any. Right. And that's when I was surprised to see crop up. Um, even though Squarespace is widely popular, I was surprised at how many you know, amongst the CTO network I um, talked to, the number of CTOs that said they had bought into Webflow. I was like, oh, that's interesting. They all, of course, there's limitations with that approach that I was like, how are you not running into those problems? And all of a sudden they start talking about, yeah, we're running into the 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 GUI only problems. So, and we can talk about that a little bit. The, the newest approach is the, what I'd call the, the Jamstack slash headless CMS, um, tools that have cropped up. And these would be, uh, well, well, first we've had static website generators for a while. Jekyll is Hugo. One of them. I think Um, so. Uh, middleman for the Ruby crowd. Gatsby is the the juice on the JavaScript React crowd. I think Next.js is another one. And there's then I, Next and there's Nuxt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Nuxt is is Vue, and right. Next is React. React. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so um, and of course, all the the great names that come along with those new products. On the back end, you've got stuff like Contentful, Sanity IO. There's some other ones that I can't remember. But the, the idea is you are truly creating content and persisting that data in a back end that has nothing to do with how it's presented, with how it's rendered, with how it shows up in the front end site. And then you utilize a, oftentimes a static site generator to pull in that data, create a build and deliver simply a build directory of HTML, CSS and JavaScript. And you publish that. And that's what I've seen more of lately. So I'm curious amongst the couple companies you're part of, what are you what are you using right now and have you looked at the other two options? Yeah, so we we talked probably 6 months or so ago about and maybe it was longer about Aspire to you and how we've got a WordPress site for our marketing site. Um and it's it's got all that WordPress cruft, that WordPress weight on it. Um, and, and I was exploring these ideas of, of the static site generators. And I, I decided through our conversation, we eventually walked away from it, um, mainly because the, the data entry, the content creation, um, was what we were concerned about. Um, so we're still on WordPress with Aspire EDU, um, over on construction specialties. I, I, I had used Squarespace for a couple different, uh, things. Um, but I actually found that Wix was just as good as Squarespace. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Webflow is actually a brand new one to me that I hadn't even heard of. And yet it's right there and it's, it's really popular as well as what it looks like. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I think, I think for a marketing website, um, for a company that's not dying for performance, um, not, doesn't need something real performant, doesn't necessarily have a ton of daily content creation. I think all those options are, are just fine. Um, and, and I, I do think the, the, um, content as a service content platform as a service, like the Webflow and the Wix and the Squarespace make a lot of sense. Yeah. The, the limitations on them. I don't. I I think this may have changed with Squarespace, but I can speak from working with a client that had a Squarespace site that was ranking lower on Google than they wanted, 
they were getting really bad performance metrics out of um, Lighthouse, the Google audit website sure. thing. And they asked me if I would work for them to change it. This is about maybe nine to 10 months ago. They wanted me to improve their metrics on Squarespace. And we just ran into problem after problem where Squarespace would not empower us to make the changes needed. I th right. think Squarespace has changed that. They are, they, they've implemented background changes that have made those audits better. Um, I just don't, I didn't in investigate it more because the choice became, we're not going to worry about this right now by, based on the client and stuff. So that was a limitation because you give up the back end management. You can't control some of those details that Google may find important um, when it comes to ranking, which is n mainly mobile speed. That's what they've added to their SEO calculation. So, right. so that's, that could be a limitation. Um, I can speak for Webflow in that it was a pretty robust product two years ago, two to three years ago when I first started was introduced to it by uh, designers that I worked with and they loved it. And these are f people that had grown to hate WordPress and its complexity. They didn't want to be devs. They just wanted to do what they knew how to do the best. And they started moving their clients to Webflow. Of course, right. they run into once they they're also designers. So then they start doing new fun stuff. And they find they hit the walls of like Webflow is not designed to let you be that custom. And that's what, I mean, Squarespace is by far very, you're in a box. And even paying them more money won't give you access to every tool you want as a designer. Webflow is somewhat like that too. Um, but they, I think they were balancing out the, the ease of management with that. Um, and the, their clients seem to be happy with it. The, the question is, I think if you want to, I think Webflow ran into problems with e-commerce. They introduced some e-commerce products to attach and that did not launch well, but I don't know the status on that. So it, it kind of depends if you're selling anything on the web too. Um, and then the, so then what do you know? We, we talked about this on this old app a little bit because I was starting to explore the static sites and stuff, but what's your opinion on those? Or do you have any knowledge of that stuff from the, from a standpoint of you've, you would ever go that way? Yeah, I've, I've never actually implemented a uh, static, um, certainly looked at it, certainly uh, thought about it, thought about going that direction, but was always concerned about um, what the interface for the content creation would be yeah. um, and never really went out there and, and did work for it. So um, be interested to see how, how you've come along with that. So what I found, so I'll, uh, I introduced this third option by separating the back end and the front end kind of pieces. And I'm going to stay down that path because what I found with sanity is a flexible document type data store that lets you um, use an, a, a pretty well put together interface that you can hand to any user to create the content that you may want to present on your site. So let's give an example of Let's say you were to, and they, they actually tell you not to do this, but I'm going to describe it like this anyway. Let's say you just had a website of pages. You can store a bunch of documents or store one huge document with like sub pages in there. And so you basically have all of these objects of pages and it's going to have a title and a date perhaps and a, a slug or a URL name that they can get to and a body. And you want to be able to te tell your users, Hey, here's the home page. Here's the contact page. Here's the about page. Here's the page about our products. 
And you want them to be able to go in and edit that content so that they don't have to go in and do any code. You're not embedding the, the, the content into a HTML page that requires a non-technical user to mess around with the content in that markup, right? Like that's what you're ultimately aiming to do. And you're able to do yeah. that um, with, with these, with the headless CMS products, the approach is that you are telling your users, update your content way over here on your right hand. And we'll have our development developers working on the left hand, handling the ability to pull that content in, create those pages in the build process and d handle deployment. You don't need to do any of that other stuff. And ultimately, I think that's great. Um, Sanity IO is the one that I've been most impressed with lately because they essentially let you take what they call the studio, the admin interface, download a copy of it, edit it, change it as you need, and then have that interact with your backend that they host. Now it starts at like 30 bucks a month and depending on your usage is how you would scale it until you would maybe hit some enterprise plan that starts at 500 bucks a month. And so I'm thinking most companies are going to just deal with how much is our data really used and it's just going to sit there. Like once you get a CMS in place, you don't change it a ton unless you're some dynamic firm that's really big anyway. That's where 500 a month may not matter to you. But most small businesses are not radically changing their content all the time. And so you wouldn't need to interact with the studio a ton. And that's just my guess. So the, the one unique thing that I haven't seen before is this idea called portable text. And it's essentially the way that, let's say you have a web page and you want to in the content, you want to have italics and you want to have some, you want to have a pull quote and you want to have a, some content that's emphasized like bold. They break the entire paragraph into an array so that you can delineate, wrap around, like you can identify each of these sections of the content instead of just having embedded like I tag or EM tags or strong tags, you would, sure. you would break that string, that entire paragraph string into little sections of an array that is then concatenated together later to serve that text back. And that gives hmm. you power as a developer to embed things, perhaps skip them on certain media, perhaps, use them a certain way on others to ignore that section and to say, no, nah, just make it text. Like it empowers you, it empowers the content manager to say, I, this is important content that should be handled differently. And it allows a developer to just say, I want to do something different with this, or I'm going to just make it normal text. And that's really powerful. Like I haven't seen that before because usually when you give a user multimedia, HTML, CSS styling access to a block of content. That's what you're getting, period. So it's a semantic, is it, is, I think this is a term. It's a semantic approach to managing text content. So you're describing what the content is, and then another medium can pick up and style it and manage it how it wants versus... Uh, how. Good. How easy is it for, for an end user to use the portable text? It looks pretty easy. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't messed with it a ton. I've seen the concepts of it. I've seen sure. it broken down the back end more than I've messed with the interface. But I like what they're trying to do. I get what they're trying to do there, I guess is what I'm saying. And so that's what I liked about Studio or the Sanity is that they give you this approach for custom interface admin interface that a developer can manage and this portable text approach which is open source so i could take this portable text i believe and implement my own admin with it at least right. from what i can tell it's what it looks like and 
I just I really like that approach because every time I run into problems with CMS is that I give a user some kind of like full um, editor access to content and I'm stuck with whatever they give me. They make that text green. I'm not I, it's hard to strip it out everywhere. And I'm like, I don't want green as the text there. Like I want to more I want to know more that the author had a point of this needs to be emphasized. You follow a, a theme approach to it that the build process comes up with. So I haven't looked at a lot of the others. Contentful was one. They seem to be more of a black box. And that's what I don't like as much as a developer. I want less web flow and more hands-on access to stuff. But if I was right. But if I was not a developer, I think something like Contentful probably is good in that it takes away it abstracts the complexity I don't really know what to do with anyway. So then we move to the front end. And what I've been looking at a lot lately is Gatsby. And have you ever messed with Create React app? Yes. Uh, when I, whenever I would, when I was, you know, toying with React, that's yeah. how I built it, you know, three, three fourths of the time. Yeah. Like if you get started with React from day one, you have to really mess with Webpack, a bundler system, packages making sure that you're using ES6 and it's getting um, processed down to the common denominator version of JavaScript for a lot of browsers. And if you use Create React app, you basically just install it and you're off on your React journey. And Gatsby is very similar to Create React app, except they approach it with this idea that you're going to have external content you need to pull in and process for the build. And that's where the big difference is because React has no such native um, kind of libraries for that. And so what can happen is if I have set up, let's say I've set up three different pages of content on Sanity.io, I can go and set up Gatsby and Gatsby will, at the point of the build time, reach out to Sanity grab, pull in the, the content using GraphQL, by the way, <clears throat> to capture that content and then dynamically build the pages that Sanity IO is deeming should be available. And then when Gatsby has built the static pages, it then publishes that to the build folder. And from there, your deployment can go anywhere that can handle you know, S3, like AWS S3, uh, Netlify, uh, Zest or whatever, Zeist. I can't remember what the, I can't remember what the um, latest, Zeit. Is that it? Zeit? Zeit? There's a bunch of different hosts that are out there and they're like, all we're going to do is host for you static website pages. And because it includes JavaScript, you can do the single page apps and stuff like that. And that's what Gatsby is building for you. And they have a ton of tutorials and a ton of plugins all related around this concept that you may have external content that you need to be built into a website. And Gatsby will, you can plug in Gatsby to build that, to build your website utilizing that external content. Um, what I've played with so far, it lets you build templates for pages. It lets you build dynamic React pages too. So if you want to build a form like a contact page, if you want to build an app that utilizes authentication, you can you can have static, you can have your static pages that are built off of your sanity IO. You can go in and create a, a an app at a certain path that will work like a React single page app that utilizes code and everything. So it's, in a way it's dynamic, whereas you have other parts that are static and built by a content management system. And then the, the last part is, what was it? oh, it handles, it definitely handles like assets, like video images and stuff like that to some degree. Um, 
and it does a lot of optimization around images that I used to that used to be a pain. So if you have a high res image that Apple wants to have like two times the the depth for the Retina screen, you it will take that image and give you all the versions that you need um, in one like one build, which is pretty cool. And then I'm trying to think. There was one other aspect I really really liked. It handles the it basically Gatsby builds to a progressive web app, so you get the benefits of everything with those in terms of setting up caching and a service worker and anything you would want. You could basically make an app out of it if you wanted to. Oh, the the, sure. the last thing is if you've ever run a blog and you don't need styling in the blog, you just want like markdown related type of headers and structure. You can easily create a markdown blog like we've done with Jekyll, I think. Um, and all that at the same time, you could have the markdown blog and the sanity IO content pages and a developer's custom react pages, um, hmm. all in one. And I've seen that work because I was I just basically was making a Frankenstein tutorial just to see if I could make all this stuff work at once. And it was not that hard. Like I got little hello worlds for all these concepts I just talked about in roughly a half day of time. Um, sure. So the community is growing strong. They have a benevolent, is it the benevolent dictator approach to um, an open source project? They have a leader who is seems to have a good um, approach to a community of open source. They have kind of a code of conduct. Um, amongst their their community their goal is to be helpful uh, i like a lot of what gatsby on the front end is doing um so much so that i think that like i i would go with gatsby before i'd go with sanity io because in many ways i think i can replicate sanity io um for my own needs on the back end a lot easier than i could all the stuff gatsby is doing for me on the front end build Right. Um, and that's what I'm, uh, my biggest question right now for the side project is, do I launch with Sanity IO for the back end just because I can launch it really fast? And later on, if I deem, you know what, I just want this content managed in a MongoDB or a Postgres with JSON fields. Um, I don't really need to have Sanity doing anything for me. The only thing that's different, I'll have to build the interface to to edit that content. Um, that's what my debate is because to me, Gatsby seems like the money winner on the front end tool, the build tool, and uh, I'm trying to figure out how far I go with the back end stuff right now. Right. So I think I, I think I can see when you would take, so, so it sounds like the, the static sites, the way everything's going, um, for now, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it seems obvious to me when you would go the route of the web flow, uh, Squarespace Wix versus static site that one is more, we don't really have to have a developer to build a website sort of thing. Yeah. Whereas the static site, you do have to have a developer to build it. Feels that way. Um, yeah. What would be the benefit of going the static site way versus a WordPress? When would you go with a WordPress, a Drupal versus a static site? Well, the thing about WordPress is just the full stack does tie you to like WordPress is going the way of like WordPress is trying to become what Gatsby is based on yeah. everything they're doing. And I think the idea is if you are doing a site for marketing purposes, that the majority of people hitting it will be on a guest level. There's so much latency and processing that WordPress does right now that you, that you don't need. And if your goal is to have the fastest most accessible, most reliable website across the world than a static site of just pure HTML, CSS, and JS 
is your performance winner by far. And there's certain limitations unless you employ some really great caching that WordPress can never do because of that. Um, now, is it really that big a deal if you're on a high bandwidth connection on your phone in an office? I don't think you notice a difference between the two, to be honest. But right. if you if you're in a low bandwidth area, or like if the if the site is being hosted um, in Northern Virginia, uh, or like wherever your uh, WordPress engine host is then yeah, you start to run into those problems of latency because of location where a site distributed by a content delivery network is fast all over the world if you want it to be. And that's probably the other big difference. Like you can't replicate your WordPress backend in as many places easily as you can a pile of HTML, CSS, and JS files. Right. And, and that's a huge benefit of the static site generation. Um, deployment approach. The, um, but I think that's what WordPress is trying to get to. I think I don't know much about Gutenberg, but I think that's what they're trying to do is say, hey, we're going to have a dynamic content interface for your users, and your builds will be like will no longer be spitting out PHP generated HTML, CSS, JavaScript. We're going to build all that up front and then you're going to deploy that package. I think that's what they're trying to get to. Um, I have no idea what Drupal's doing. If they are trying to do something advanced, I know they're arguing about it relentlessly right now because that's, that's <laughs> how Drupal moves forward with stuff. So I don't know. I, I really haven't paid attention to those older systems, but I know WordPress has talked about understanding what Gats Gatsby's approach and Jekyll's approach represents to them. Right. And I know that Drupal back right before I left Drupal was when they were starting to talk about moving to the headless CMS yeah. uh, model. So I, I, I'm sure they're there. I just don't know much about it. The problem, at least with my knowledge of Drupal is that whole central node thing just becomes a, an albatross. Um, in terms of, if you look at the back ends of, for the content management systems, like they, they were telling me in the tutorials and stuff, don't create pages, create like content models, like we do in Ruby right. and Rails and Laravel and stuff, like approach it so that in, if you were doing a website on baseball players, you would have player athlete as an object model and then you would create pages based on those players and if they're part of a team you have teams not pages team pages kind of thing and the idea is to abstract the content to stand alone and then use your um your coding platform your build platform to take that content those models and create the pages based on those associations between the data, that kind of thing. Whereas I th Drupal just stuck everything on a node with, with custom attributes so that a page and a person would be on the same node table with different attributes between the two. And right. it just became hell after you got past like three or four different node types, um, at least in my experience. And I think that that's definitely from a data standpoint, I mean, the idea too is with Sanity IO, the idea, let's say Gatsby burns out, the candle on Gatsby burns out in a year and a new player takes over. So now you've got a brand new um, type of development system that we haven't heard of or thought of before. Well, your Sanity IO data is completely separate. It doesn't care what front end does with it. It's just got the content and then your new, your new development front end starts from scratch, but you don't have to go to your content team and go, let's change all the content. Once again, for this stuff, you're just completely separate. I think that's a, 
And that's what WordPress is trying to get to because so far, so much of their theming and stuff has been built into the back end, um, storing CSS in the back end and stuff like that. And that's what I think these new systems are. They're, if you're going to have to redo your website every three to four years, which a lot of companies do, you're now separating the content from being tied to that uh, migration, if that makes sense. Yeah, and and I think it's it's inevitable that it will be there will be something new in three to four years. Uh, it, it it's just cyclical. Everything works that way. Yeah. Um, yes, Drupal and WordPress have been around for 10 plus years at this point. Um, but they've moved from being the platforms that all the bloggers use to being enterprise systems. Um, and they're trying to get back to simplicity as well, but things change and having that data being as portable as, as possible is, is a good thing. Um, I know we always said we can, we can extract your data from Drupal and give it to you. That's, that's not an issue. Yeah, that was a true statement, but you ended up with the data structured as Drupal wanted it. Yeah. So anything you wanted to do with it, you had to write, um, scripts to restructure the data the way you wanted it for, for a different system. Yep. So, um, if portable text takes off, that's one way of structuring things. That's not necessarily data. Um, but to some degree it is, um, so interesting. So, well, I'm, I'm glad you've gotten to where you've been able to dig into this because I knew it was out there and I knew new things were changing, but I'd never had a, a project that I need to implement anything on the new CMS. Yeah. And I feel like, like the next question is, okay, what if you have a company and the content must change based on the user? Because that's what a, a static site doesn't play f- well. And that, and, and so that to me, you still want to have, your headless CMS, you still want that because right. you can still pull in the data. You can still create a new front end that is dynamic, that pulls in the data from the back end based on the user. And it's still going to have latency because you got to build it on the fly, so to speak, in most cases. But you're going to, to have the flexibility of you tell the content team or the executive in charge of just writing stuff or whatever, hey, this is your interface, it never changes. Here's our front end and it will request the data as necessary. And we're gonna build it this time all in custom React or all in Vue, it doesn't matter. But you're able to make that choice where you're saying this is not a full data migration, which is where you always, to me, the cost is part of any website update is how long it takes to redo, rewrite the content, switch databases with the content, clean it up, pull out the styling that was embedded in it, um, marrying the work that the front end devs and the back end content, non technical people need to do. Like, that's the hardest part. And I feel like if you stabilize your website company content into one like one place and then let the front end presentation folks do their magic on the other side, you're better. That's a long-term stability. That's what a CTO, in my opinion, wants over time. Right. Um, I agree. It's now the thing is (laughs) that sounds like the golden path and it's, that's full of, yeah, but what about all these edge cases? And I know, I know they're there. There are all sorts of scenarios where you are not going to have a clean data source for the next iteration of the website. Something's going to change. Something has to be migrated. But I think if you, from day one, say, we are not going to allow the design to be stored in with the content data, you are making that long-term choice for less pain when you do those updates. That's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, Yeah, that makes sense. I can say over the last six months, 
before I started this job with Hierology and before I started looking at the front end with Gatsby and stuff, I was definitely a big fan of Vue. Still do like it a lot. But I feel like I just have to side with React across the two. At least still at least still for now. As which one has the most robust use and community? Sure. I like Evan View, the Evan Yu, the lead of the View JS um, community. I think it's the easiest one to learn. I like their approach on the packages and such, but I feel like React from a from a just a how much work is being done by how many people? Facebook and all their own product issues aside, React is still the most powerful, robust um, JavaScript f- front end framework to use. That's just yeah, I think that's true. It's just a question of do you really need all that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or does you or does view give you what you need? Yeah. So that's a that's a whole separate discussion. Totally. But seeing Gatsby's power has 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 somewhat made me think about it again. Um, sure. And as I, without a doubt, five years from now, I'll still be we'll still be talking React and View and some other VR based framework that crops up or something like that. You know. So I'm just not sure, you know, where it all goes. But anyway, yeah, that's that's my uh, CTO take on the 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 new uh, uh, three approaches to CMSs and what people in those in our CTO like roles would be considering. I guess. Interesting. I'll be, I'll be interested to hear uh, if it, if your project goes to completion, goes into production, what, what else you uh, found along the way? Yeah, I think from what I hear, the person that's really like running it um, from the business side says that he's got some interested people. So I don't know that I'll be coding it versus his own developers coding it, but um, I have a big say in the stack. And I think this is the, the Gatsby sanity approaches are a bill that will provide the fastest way to launch doesn't mean that it right. doesn't mean we would stick with sanity as the long term back end until I know more, but it would get us out there and then we could extract the data into our own store because sure honestly the the most the best thing about sanity is that front end piece for editing the data in terms of the storage of it I mean it's like a, just a big mongo d b like object or something it's nothing magical um in that case at least that i can tell so anyway that's all i got around the cms question well cool all right very good then uh then we will uh we will catch up again in another couple of weeks all right later thanks for listening to the cto think podcast Show notes and previous episodes can be found on our website at ctothink.com. Reviews on Apple iTunes are always appreciated and help promote the show. Patreon contributions help us to produce episode transcripts, which allow people that are deaf or hard of hearing to access the show. If you have feedback, ideas, or want to be a guest, please email us at hello at ctothink.com. Show music is Dumpster Dive by Mark Wallach, licensed by premiumbeat.com. Voiceover work by meganvoices.com. You'll hear from us next week. We'll be right back.